In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of the Militia, pray for us. All you holy martyrs, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Welcome back to our uh, formation classes here for Growth and Holiness. Uh, I will be looking at the live stream chat as this goes on, so feel free to throw out any questions or problems uh, with the broadcast if you have any. Struggling, which is the act of um, being engaged in the spiritual life, are liable to three attacks. The first of which is the human spirit. The human spirit is characterized by uh, four uh, impulses. The desire for peace, comfort, ease, and having ample provisions for the body. It vitates what we do, and it can influence an act without making it completely evil. Now there is a division of spirits understood as diabolic spirits, the Holy Spirit, or also angelic spirits, and um, there's also a spirit of the world, although that is mixed in with the diabolic spirit. And so when we feel impulses within us, it falls on us to discern what that spirit and where that spirit comes from. We know well that our body's chemistry or the way that our body reacts to certain sounds, sights, or other things can give us feelings of excitement or uh, sorrow. We also know that seeing or saying even certain things can stir ourselves up. We know that God himself can bring on tears. He can also move us to great acts of bravery that are beyond our strength or our normal disposition. We can also feel within ourselves great evil, but not consent to it. For example, when we feel the impulse of passion to hatred, which sometimes can be good if it's hatred of sin, but oftentimes is bad if it's hatred against a person. Unfortunately for us, um, and our, the greatest sin that man can fall into, of course, is uh, pride, which the fruits of pride are despair and presumption. We, because of, of our love of ourselves and our love of drama, we oftentimes like to imagine that the source of our falls uh, come from the devil or the world, and we're in this great mess, wrestling match. When in reality, uh, it is more likely that we just had a weak will and were cowards, and that we didn't want to struggle for whatever reason. Now when I mention these four impulses of spirit, I do wish to make a few observations. When I say, and the author says ease, he does not mean doing things within your strength or practicing virtue because a good habit has become easy. He means a life or a, a, a set of circumstances which we find agreeable and well within our strength. Not at our strength, but well within it, to the point that we'd have to not exert ourselves. When we speak of comfort, that means that the circumstances that we find ourselves in are agreeable to us. It doesn't necessarily mean the comfort of touch, but just that we feel unagitated, 
by what surrounds us. And peace, now this is a particularly difficult one to assess as being a human spirit. He is not referring to the peace of God, which we will talk about in a few minutes, nor is he talking about being peaceable with men. What peace he's referring to is the desire to avoid conflict that the human spirit moves us towards trying to avoid conflict and confrontation. It is the spirit oppo opposed to the reality that man's life upon earth is a warfare. Now, we must be on guard then against these uh, matters as a result of the fact that we have a human spirit and there's nothing we can do to get rid of it. All we can do is suppress our human spirit so that the dominant spirit that acts in us is the Holy Spirit, not our own spirit. So that's our goal here, is that we empty ourselves out so that God's operations in us are perfect and that we perfectly are in union with God. Moments of excitement and exaltations being assessed as visitations of grace or any form of sensible consolation in a spiritual or neutral activity most likely is the human spirit. Now God allows these from time to time and he allows us to experience them because it actually encourages us in prayer or it encourages us to do the good thing. But we should not fill our heads with the idea that because, for example, we sang a psalm well and it made us feel good, or we saw a beautiful religious picture and it filled us with a feeling of excitement or exaltation that we have experienced the operations of grace within our soul. If anything, it should we should be more suspicious of it, that rather our spirit is feeling exalted. This provides some context for why the saints were never too excited by things that would normally excite people. I mean, even devout people. We have to be on guard against our existing good works becoming warped. That is, that within our good works we seek peace, comfort, ease, or ample provisions. How can one seek ample provisions in a good work? that by developing a certain diplomacy, certain habits, or a certain program that one might profit, benef uh, might, might profit financially from it, or one might be enabled to have greater earthly successes, is an example of a warping of a good work. Or for example, if one was volunteering at the soup kitchen, and I speak to you bachelors, because there were cute girls there and one wanted to attract their attention, although one started off their good work with the purest heart to serve God, it soon becomes more about winning the affection of a young lady. Speaking indiscreetly about our spiritual state and feelings, This is uh, something that you hear me um, speak about frequently. This is keeping the secret of the kingdom, the kingdom within you. There are two ways you can do this. The first of which is to not speak anybody who is not a master of your soul or is not in some way intimate to your soul. For example, it is appropriate for a husband to speak about certain spiritual matters with his wife. In other ones, it is not appropriate for him to speak about with his wife. We can speak to our spiritual directors about certain things and our uh, novice masters or superiors within the orders. But we do not speak about it with strangers, even devout people. And we also speak about spiritual matters at the right place and the right time. If I'm going to provide counsel to a knight, I'd rather do it when we had set aside the time for counsel so that he knows that this is the time that he may approach or ask questions. 
than if we were having a celebration and all of a sudden I slipped into some type of disciple master mode, which is inappropriate, unless it was being, unless they were understood that that was the, the end of it. When we receive an illumination, to quickly think that it comes from God. I know all of you are pursuing spiritual perfection. And as such, you're going to find that light is going to more frequently come into your life. You are going to be told about aspects of yourself that you do not understand. But you're also going to get a lot of other thoughts. Some of these are not from God. Some of them are from demons. And some of them are from your own human spirit and judgment. So we must test our illuminations. You know, you might ask, what is an illumination? An illumination might be the discovery of, for example, one's predominant fault and why it became one's predominant fault. This must be tested through time and through discretion. For example, bringing it up in spiritual direction. And also to know that if it is truly from God, it will be a present and persistent thought that one cannot leave off rather than if it is from the human spirit, which may come and go quickly, and then we may never remember it again. Another example of an illumination is when one has authority over others, sometimes lights into their conscience or even their sins or past acts might be revealed. Unless it was necessary for one to know these things, they could very much be a deception of the devil to incline you to vanity or they may be completely the source of your imagination. You don't know. Until you see things come to pass, and then you can evaluate why God might have shared this or that matter with you. Also, the prediction of future events. Um, there are many things that our minds can see where things are going, and because there are certain patterns of human behavior and also God acts in similar ways, for example, punishing sin, we can see a certain trajectory that somebody is on in their life and predict that they will encounter hardships and punishments for those things. And then they come to pass and we might be tempted to think we're prophets. So that is an illumination that has come about through learning, but not from the Holy Spirit, and is probably more rooted in our human spirit than in God revealing something in prophetic wisdom to us. Levity. Levity oftentimes reveals the human spirit. We can think of the rule here where it says, Do not speak light or silly words, and do not laugh immoderately. It is unbelievably unbecoming of a man, and is certainly most unbecoming of a knight, that we always be jesting. There is a time for jest. It is a virtue to jest at the right place in the right time. But for people who jest all the time, especially when they're in holy places, in holy times like retreats or on feast days, it is completely inappropriate. I'm not willing to throw people down into the pits of hell over it, but there is a reason why God says, Woe to those who laugh, for they shall weep. Excessive jesting and excessive levity shows an unseriousness about a person. And even worse, once again back to vanity, people mistake it as being the Holy Spirit of joy, when in reality joy is the peaceable abiding of God that illumines mundane actions and make them pleasurable because one is resting with and living for God. Self-annoyance or disgust which arises from our faults. This is not from God, it is from the human spirit. If God has patience with us when we fall into our predominant faults, nor does he turn from us in a sense, especially if these things are not mortal sins, but continues to abide in our soul, if he doesn't flee from us in disgust, and we know that about his spirit, then how can we then take disgust with ourselves and say that it comes from him? When we fall into our repeated patterns of bad behavior, we should just rather quickly humble ourselves before God, admit that all corruption comes from us and that we accept the responsibility 
and say, I repent and I will amend my life and move forward. Feelings of disgust are natural impulses, especially if the thing that we did is somehow bodily related. But we should realize that fostering these types of more natural feelings will warp our sense of what is uh, proportionate in reaction to sins. For example, missing Mass on Sunday when one is bound to go, or blaspheming the holy name of God, is a far greater sin than even sins of fornication. Of course, there are things you can do that would make the sin of fornication first, but I'm talking about them just as abstract concepts. But one may feel greater disgust with oneself for that sin of fornication, when in reality a proportionate response would feel more inner, uh, a greater need for repentance for those sins that directly attacked God. Immoderate attachment to devotional practices. Although you will notice that when you become novices, I routinely and I would advise in the future when you have novices, that when somebody has persisted in years upon years of devotion in some way, to not quickly change anything, but to rather allow the Holy Spirit to guide them away from those things or um, you know, maybe to mitigate them as those habits are replaced by new ones, such as the office, mental prayer, quiet, penance, good works. If one feels disquieted because of an extra devotional activity that they have failed to do, that can come from the Holy Spirit. The Imitation of Christ speaks about it, and so do numerous other spiritual authors. But if we were to say no, if our spiritual directors or our master said to us, you must abandon this devotional practice, then we know we have a moderate and an immoderate attachment to it. For there is no practice unless we are bound by a vow to observe it, that we cannot be instructed under obedience to put down. Nor if it becomes impossible to continue to do it, for example, if somebody every year made a trip to um, some Marian shrine, but this year they couldn't because they were broke. Being immoderately attached to it would fill one with sorrow, and that is not the sorrow of the spirit, that is the sorrow of the human spirit. An overabundance of zealous projects and good thoughts almost always arise from our human spirit. God is very singular. He has a simple plan for us. Now we need to be flexible with that plan. But one of the ways that the devil completely defeats a person full of zeal and good works is to continue to tax their mind with more and more devotional practices and more and more good works and more and more good thoughts of ways to change. He, like a flood, desires to rain down on us too many thoughts so that we become overwhelmed, so that we stop keeping watch over our conduct, so that we discard things that we are strictly bound to do, and by this way cool the fire of divine charity within us. Rather, we should only approach new zealous projects if we've received a blessing for them, and as far as good thoughts go, even with these, we should rather try to come, keep a continual form of recollection that the most important thought is one of repentance and asking God for mercy. We can recall those lines of the gospel where our Lord said, There will be no sign given to this wicked and perverse generation except the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah, of course, was a call to repentance. Human prudence with great solemnity. I particularly like this line of the author, to be ever safe is to be ever feeble. There are people who practically give you a speech when they explain to you what limitation they had a year ago and why they don't do something that they clearly probably rests within their power to do. You invite them to do a good work with you, and instead of just say declining it, they have to provide a long explanation to you about how, if they did this good work, they would become cranky, poor, sick, or some other matter, when in reality such an explanation comes most of the time from the human spirit, although we can find cause to 
distrust ourselves, perhaps we're just known as an irritable and hard to get along with person, or as a judgmental person, then they feel the need to do it for our sake. So there is even occasion to still hate ourselves when people feel the need to give this to us. But we should never take great solemnity, solemnity in our actions with human prudence. It's nothing praiseworthy, and the world loves human prudence. They put those people into middle management. So there's nothing wrong with human prudence. It's just something that, um, to approach it as some type of profound moving of the spirit, when it's something that could be easily discerned by watching a TED Talk on time management, uh, should help us keep proper perspective on uh, whether or not it's a big deal. Unnecessary recreations. Well, that pretty much describes the entire society today, doesn't it? 95, 99% of people. And then the people who it's not uh, infecting uh, tend to be uh, the hustle culture of uh, let's never work until we're rich and then happiness, I guess. And then they're empty and then they start YouTube channels to explain um, how empty they are about it. When we feel the draw to feel rest when we are already rested, to eat when we are already satisfied, to see strange things when we're not sad, that is to partake in pleasures when it's not a remedy for sorrow and not at a time when our director says, no, I want you to do this thing that you've always done because it's good for you. Right? When we start feeling the need to do more than that, and it's not because we're dealing with some very difficult sorrow. And I, the reason why I say that is because we have, to re, uh, we have to realize that sadness in our life oftentimes arises, um, is a demon. And we are at, have to try to keep a joyful disposition. So it can be acceptable when somebody's going through a particularly hard time for their director or even their novice master to tell them to increase the pleasures in their life. I'll give you a concrete example. St. Faustina in the Divine Mercy was uh, a bit melancholy at one point due to all of her troubles, and her director forced her to take extra walks in, the, in I guess, the convent's uh, gardens and to force herself to laugh. Because being amongst nature and having some levity does help remedy sorrow. I'm not sure either thing worked, but it shows you at least a picture of a, uh, a physician trying to heal a soul of excessive sorrow. And finally, one that we have condemned as knights in numerous counsel, what we call, what the author rightfully calls the spirit of dispensations. Especially because knights have a certain degree of autonomy to dispense themselves from the rule at times, one can develop a spirit of dispensation where one rather seeks to find a reason to excuse themselves rather than making use of something very rarely. Soon, this uh, human spirit has a person doing the barest minimums and their charity cools. Of greatest danger is the human spirit uh, the greatest danger of the human spirit is that vice begins to appear as virtue. The example that was developed by the author is to mistake grace for the natural abilities that come to us from nature, which varies from person to person. Bookworms, who've always liked reading, should not take too much delight in the fact they're able to regularly spiritual read. It's not a mark of grace, per se. People who have always been kind and hospitable, being kind and hospitable while wearing a habit is not a mark of improvement. People who are by disposition quiet and not talkers, continuing to be so, is not, you know, a sign of the seventh heaven. The imperfect, i.e., almost all of us, I assume, although, you know, maybe there's somebody here who is, most of our thoughts, words, and affections do not come from the Holy Spirit. They come from the human spirit. Don't feel bad about that. Literally every saint was in that state until they more or less reached 
the higher parts of the illuminative way, or what is called the illuminative way, or transforming union. And many saints never, canonized saints never met that until the end. Some probably never. Where the dominant action in one's soul is God himself. Or uh, one's action is God himself. So whenever we find things in ourselves that are praiseworthy, let's have a low opinion of them. They don't mean so much. But do you remember that when we were born, that these still things, these good things, for example, studiousness, quietness, temperance, or whatever we're inclined to, these things were still gift from God, and we can still foster them. They just aren't the mark of conversion. So we can think of the rule here where it says, set your trust in God, attribute to him and not to yourself whatever good you discover within you. Even our natural good inclinations came from God, and they normally are related to our mission in some way. The real triumph of grace, the real operations of the Holy Spirit, is those things that we are not inclined to, and those vices that we fall easily into overcoming them. That is the sign of God's true operation within the soul. We're always going to mix our personality with our works until we're perfect. It is going to mar the perfection of the work. But that also should tell us something. That the more our work does not have that specific flavor of ourselves, of our personalities, the more that somebody or an outsider was able to look at it and not see something that makes it distinctly ours, the more pleasing and better that work is. The human spirit is the greatest enemy of the advanced. And he's not speaking here of people in the illuminative way, I believe. He's just referring to people who understand the mechanics and live a spiritual life as their habitual state of life. They're not going through, they're not like dieters not to harass dieters, but like diet, the dieting way is one of constant switching between various forms of abstinence and temperance, organizational eating habits, losing the weight, gaining it back, and then going back on a diet again. And so many people pursue their spiritual lives in the exact same way. We would not call these people advanced. We would call them either beginner or spiritually, the spiritually warped as um, some other very uh, harsh spiritual authors call them. But if you, as a resting thing, live out fully to the point that even when you tear down, when you knock down your house due to sin, you know how to quickly rebuild it, then you might be fallen into that more advanced category. And so you need to be most on guard against your own spirit. It is only overcome by incessant mortification of the will. Which, of course, is harder than everything else. And even more so, many things that afflict us that we need to do strengthen our wills, but doesn't always necessarily strengthen our will for good. It can strengthen our will to even become more stubborn with other people or uh, when we get directed to do things. But as a rule of thumb, if we look at the fact that we know that peace, comfort, ease, and ample provisions are its traits, then we know that when something comes to sacrificing ease, peace, comfort, or ample provisions, that is presented to us by providence, for example, when somebody wants to eat at a place that we would rather not, or somebody wishes us to do something that we would rather not, or we have to give up a place that was quite comfortable for the sake of another, these are ways that we can mortify our will and defeat our human spirit. The author quotes St. Bernard, and as our father, I thought it was a good quote to consider. Everyone is his own enemy. Man urges and precipitates himself into evil in such a way 
that if he would only keep his own hands from suicide, he need fear the violence of no one else. So even if we, the devil, the world, were not tempting us, we are so damaged being children of Adam that we would still be our own enemy. The discernment of spirit is difficult, especially when evaluation works. Now, how might we go about discerning spirits as they present themselves to us? The first thing we must do is chase away all presumption. We must not assume that we are God's best friend, that God will save us in the sense of like we will save ourselves or God has to, or that God would even send us good things. We have to profoundly distrust ourselves and our own conclusions. Even when we've reached a conclusion, even if that conclusion is more de self-deprecating than um, the other conclusion, we should still distrust ourselves. If the matter is of great importance, it should be brought to a director or to, depending on what it is, to another person. If it's of minor importance, most of the time you deal with it yourselves. We must practice sincere humility. This is very difficult. But one of the areas that one can practice most sincere humility is to realize that there are many things, places, and things to do constantly, but as a rule of thumb, we only have a very narrow set of things that we ourselves are either bound or must do. And by not interfering in other people's work, business, or what have you, or thinking we could do them better, this is the way that we can begin to practice most sincere humility. Also to realize that we fall into sins many times a day, and that many of our actions are imperfect. On top of that, we are quite blind in this. So, when the rule says, weep daily over your sins, a big source of our daily meditation is finding the time to practice humility before God by examining our conscience, admitting our blindness, and asking for forgiveness for our sins. Disquietude is also a great discerner of purity. What does that mean? It means when we feel disquiet about something not going well, or what we perceive to not go well, then we know that the human spirit is at work there. For you members of the choir, that's when you sing a bad piece of music, and then you're disquieted about it. You should not be. Even if the sin, even if it came from neglect in your own fault, you should not be disquiet about it. Rather, you should just accept with humility that you needed to prepare yourself more, but that you didn't because you're a son of Adam, and just say you repent and move on. For those who practice at any form of teaching or um, perhaps, uh, you know, some matter at work, is that when we try our best and then things don't work out and we become agitated, whether angry or uh, cast down, then we know once again that we weren't really making a good offering to God with our work. We were making an offering to ourselves and our own vanity and people's high opinion of us. If we don't feel disquieted when things don't work out according to the world, if we feel nothing in us, but rather we are just solicited to make sure that we offer all of our works back to God, then we know that at least for that moment, we might have had a pure intention, although we shouldn't trust ourselves. Once again, back to those natural abilities, some people struggle to feel shame more than others, and so they never feel particularly elevated by circumstances, nor cast down by bad ones. So we just don't know. It's important not to think about it too much. But just realize that disquietude in things is normally a symptom of the human spirit. And finally, hiddenness. If we desire that the good work that we do remain hidden, then we know that at least at an intellectual level, we've um, 
are trying to make a pure act to God. If we want something good that we do to be known, just to be known, so people have higher opinion of us, or maybe just a little higher of opinion of us, or so that we feel kinsmanship with them, then we've made a mistake. We want our good works to be hidden. We want our spiritual insights, for the most part, to be hidden. We want, definitely want our penances to be hidden unless we're making restitution to another person. The only thing we should want people to know are our faults and our sins. Not that we brandish our sins because that could scandal them, but if they are aware deeply that we are a sinner, then that shouldn't bother us too much. If anything, it brings a lot of relief to one's life because then people won't bother you and ask you for a lot of questions because they'll just have a low opinion of you. Nature loves what is beautiful, what is good, and what is perfect. Numerous authors say this. What does that mean? I already talked about how when we feel certain excitements and other things in our life, that we shouldn't think much about it being coming from God. And so you should also know that the fact that you like beautiful things, even sacred artwork, is not a mark of the Holy Spirit. It's just a mark of your human nature. Now the problem is nowadays is that human natures are so unbelievably warped and evil that nowadays they don't like normal things. So one can easily become confused and think, well, at least I like normal things, at least not like that guy over there who likes ugly things, right? Because he's profoundly damaged his, his nature. But one should not think that their solicitude to have nice things comes from God. In fact, one should think the exact opposite. And be very worried if one is too solicitous for nice things. That goes for everything. That's little objects too. Your breveries, your books, your desk lamps, all that type of stuff. We're supposed to be detached from everything. Now, I will just tell you that this is a very hard thing to do in a marriage and with children. Although children constantly break and damage things, so that's a good way to practice it. But unfortunately, while we may have these, if you give your wife warped or damaged things too much, she might learn to not like you. So be very careful. But one way to do this is to let her have your ta her tastes at the expense of yours. Finally, this also applies to reading. It really applies to reading. It's nice to read poetry. It's nice to read real good philosophy. It's nice to read Latin and all those types of things. It can make us feel good. But let's not think that that's coming from God. It oftentimes is not. It's just coming from our human spirit. I have read some really crummily put together books by some overly wordy priests in my life during adoration or mental prayer that helped me a lot. But I had to get through those books against my better nature because I would rather read something written in a way that's more agreeable to me. For example, that book, Happier You Poor, I mean, Sparing, Sharing, Caring, he said that 8,000 times. I've never forgotten it, but the number of times that has helped me keep the vow of detachment, and that's why God wanted me to read it. But the author is just not to my liking. I mean, I don't think he's a bad guy, I just... Boy, I mean, nature did not agree with that at all. It wasn't to my liking. So how can we put ourselves to the test? How can we figure out if something is coming from our human spirits? First, by submitting in obedience. Just the very act of bringing a matter up before a director or for a superior and saying, what should I do? Already test the human spirit. And then one's reaction to the blessing or one's reaction to the condemnation or the, 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 the remarks can help one test if it really is coming from God or not. Examining if a thing increases other virtues or it is an exceptional outlier. My friends, if you start bread and water fasting and that makes you excited, that's good. If nothing else changes with that, that's weird. It's almost, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's a mark of the human spirit when one takes up an exceptional discipline of some kind 
like a regular form of bread and water fasting or long prayer or what have you, and no other improvements are being made at the same time. In fact, what you will oftentimes find is that you go backwards in more important areas. That's why you see so many um, books saying, don't do things without the blessing of your director. Don't do things without permission. What we want is the spirit of captivity. And the, the author who at one point kind of, I don't remember if it's earlier in the book or it's later, but he does kind of attack rules of life. But in this case, he says, no, submission to a written rule really helps here. The spirit of captivity, that is where we completely constrain our human spirit. That is where we look at ourselves and, get, and say, no, I'm putting you in a box and you're not getting out of it has to be universal and extending beyond just questions of sin. So for example, when our rule says, do not give in to the desires of a corrupt nature, we know that how we should live then should never approach the question of, should I do this thing because it's a sin? But rather, should I do this thing because I even desire it at all? Am I prompted to do this by another? Is it a cause of charity? Or am I choosing this thing because of my nature? It must be strictly kept in little matters as well as great. For example, in our rule, it prohibits eating to the point where one is overly full. Actually, it really pro it, it prohibits eating till one feels a sense of fullness. That to have the spirit of captivity is to keep that as strictly as one would keep the common recital of the office. Or in modesty of dress, where one shuns fashion. It must be kept even when there is no sweetness. Oftentimes it feels good to do something that we know to be good. But that feeling of it being good comes from our spirit, oftentimes not from God. I do make a little asterisk here. The, he warns against taking on additional obligations without a blessing, but I wanted to remind everybody, do not make private vows. You may have certain habits that get blessed. You may have certain things that your director or your novice master you agree you're going to do, but you can't take on an additional vow without first receiving a blessing. And I believe it has to come from the Grand Master, but I personally would be against most of that, unless there was a really good reason to do it, and it had been tested for years before doing it. And finally, it also does not mean that we must always do what we dislike. He felt the need to stress that, he develops it a lot more. But it's important to realize that the spirit of captivity is not the spirit of torture. He even highlights how wrong this attitude is by talking about Jansenism in one of the various books that advocated for it and was condemned by the church. It's very difficult to discern this but it's important to remember that many good things in life bring pleasure with them, and that is acceptable. In fact, the real disposition is that one is able to rejoice with God when it is time to rejoice, and one is sorrowful when it is time to be sorrowful. Recall the lessons that St. Bernard gave us in the way of humility, where he identifies unseasonableness as this vice that must be overcome in a mark of pride. So rather, we should want to do the good things that God wants us to do. In fact, we should want to, we should like living the rule. We should like going to Vespers. We should like eating with our families. But what we have to do is to come down hard on our human spirit, which, which again, to go back to, how do we know? Is this driving me to peace? in the sense of avoiding any type of the spiritual war, 
Am I driving me to comfort or ease? Or am I providing for too ample provision for my body? And finally, the repose of the soul. Wherever we are at right now is where God wants you to be at right now. It almost sounds trite to say, but it's not. The place you live, the job you have, your spouse, your friends, or your lack thereof. We have to find repose. We may need to change things. If they do, then you'll be directed to do it by somebody in authority or through a persistent thought that will need to be discerned and tested, as we've talked about. Is it coming from this human spirit, or is it coming from the devil, or is it coming from the Holy Spirit? But we know that we can't change our class today. No one today is going to go out and become ordained a priest or get married. No one today is probably going to change their job. I am what I am, I'm married to who I'm married, and I live where I live. I love God, and I want to keep my commandments and do my duties well for him. In fact, this is all he wants from me. If I try to do something that he doesn't want me to do, it will not please him. Even if it involved great sacrifice, even if it involved great ardor or effort on my part, trying to be or do something that he does not want me to be or do will upset him. It will injure me. Now, I might add that the repose of the soul is the way that we will begin to hear God's voice. And it oftentimes does invite us up higher. But then we have to seek blessings and make sure it's not a temporary thing. What do I mean? Just like I say it's always a bad decision in a major desolation to make a major decision, so much so it is also a bad decision that after, for example, going to a wonderful Mass, to resolve to do a great thing that may be on your strength. You must try to give time to these things to discern them. <coughs> I know somebody who um, particularly enjoys reading fiction, and they have encountered that poor dilemma that we all do, that when we work, we only have so much free time. But there's many spiritual things they want to do, and as such they feel tension to move away from reading their fiction to focus on other things. However, this is not allowed by their director. The director thinks they should continue to read. Now they could go on and feel agitated that God has called them to greater things. Or more rightly, they can try to find repose of the soul. And they should hope that God rather purifies this thing or makes them suffer it, that is, continuing to read fiction. That they continually suffer it until they hate the thing, so that then maybe it be the right time that they might be delivered from it. So let us find repose then in who and what we are and where we are right now. Not be overly eager for anything. Let us be very careful about when we feel movements within ourselves and that we check and learn from them. If we begin checking these spirits, these things that arise within us, you will find that you will need time to think and that the time of mental prayer may need to be increased. This is great mortification, that one takes the spirit that arise within his mind, and before making decisions, they take them to prayer and do the work. They put them before God, and they ask him to move them. It is even greater mortification to take these things and put them before our director. Just the act of delay, just the grinding down of ourselves a little bit more, that's what's going to make the room for the Holy Spirit to come into us. Are there any questions?
Brothers, do you have any questions? Okay, so on that note then, we'll end it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. God bless.